Welcome to our second lecture covering um, the email process that we're going to be using in this class. We're going to refresh a little bit on what we cut learned in video one. And so here are some examples of how or situations we might find ourselves in as paralegals and how we would decide whether to use an email or some other means of communication to communicate this information. We'll say to the client. So the first is reminding a client about a hearing date. This is a really common thing to do. We've already talked to the client once about this and we just want to call him or her maybe the day before the hearing to say just to make sure you're coming or to make you aware of the date even if the client isn't coming. This would be great for email. This is kind of a classic email, communicating information like dates. There's nothing privileged here. The other side knows about the hearing. So there's no problem at all sending an email for this purpose. Again, unless your client would prefer a telephone call. The next one, though, is more problematic. Discussing strategies concerning settlement offers. What if you are proposing certain strategies and you accidentally send it to opposing counsel? Wow, that would be truly awful. A uh, type of thing that probably would get you fired. So you don't want to do that. And I, again, my philosophy is if my email, if I can't show it to opposing counsel, I shouldn't be sending it really under uh, almost any circumstances except if it's very very unusual and so since we obviously wouldn't want to share our strategies for settlement negotiations uh, we are going to say no to this one this is not best to schedule an email now of course saying hey let's talk about our strategies can we schedule a time that would be great or let's schedule a face-to-face -face meeting again email is great to schedule those sensitive conversations Asking the client to call you. Yes, this is very good. Again, there's nothing wrong with this. You're going to want to tell the client why you want to talk, but be very uh, broad about that topic. For example, you might say case strategy or uh, to we need to discuss a settlement offer we received from the other side, that type of thing. That would be a, a good way of approaching that uh, issue. So emails can be very effective to ask the client to, to call you. So that would be a yes. Ask the client if he or she has received your letter. Again, very appropriate. You're not saying what the letter said. You'd probably say, did you receive my letter dated blank date? Uh, this might be appropriate if there's something very time sensitive about it or there's been a bit of time since the time that you sent it and you haven't heard from the client. Perhaps it got lost in the mail or perhaps the client has forgotten about it. So again, an email would be very appropriate. What you wouldn't want to do, though, is to attach the letter to the email um, because if the let is, and this would it'd be fine to attach if it didn't cover confidential information. But if it covers that confidential information, attaching to the email is the same as putting in the email. It becomes vulnerable to the uh, client forwarding it um, inadvertently or intentionally to someone else, or you making an error about who you're sending it to. Criticizing something your client did. You know, none of us likes to tell our client or anyone really, you did something wrong. And so you might think to yourself, well, I have to tell the client, you know, what she wore to court last time wasn't appropriate. I have to do it because she wants to come again. But an email, I mean, to say that to them face to face or on the telephone, it sounds really awkward. Um, an email, maybe that's the way of going. No, it's not. It's better to suck it up and just say, again, you, you want to be as diplomatic as possible. Here are our recommendations as to what you ought to wear. You may say, but I could dodge the whole issue by sending the email. If somebody didn't dress appropriately for the court hearing, um, are they going to be in tune enough to pick up on the subtleties of your email? Again, email is a very blunt weapon. It doesn't have subtleties. But when you're talking with somebody, you can feel them out. You may start talking about it and they may say something like, yeah, I realized I was underdressed. Oh, well, that is a nice entry for you to say, this is what we recommend that clients wear to court. On the other hand, you may have a client that's really unaware that what he or she wore wasn't appropriate. So you may need to be a bit more direct, but having a conversation allows you to gauge how direct you need to be in that situation. So this is awkward. You're not going to want to send an email about it. To forward a legal bill to the client. This is absolutely fine. Um, 
most firms mail it, but uh, sending it via email, maybe sending it both ways is perfectly appropriate. There shouldn't be anything in the legal bill that is privileged. And so uh, it's fine to communicate that bill in that direction, in that method. Explain to your client, explain your client's position on a particular legal point to the paralegal for the opposing party. Not a good idea. Um, sometimes you do need to explain your client's position, but you don't probably want to reduce it to writing because are you going to get every nuance of the position exactly right? You don't want to lock your client into a particular position that he or she may want to tweak over time. And so it's best probably to share that verbally. If for some reason it is important that you really go in and explain the details of the position, you're going to want to do it in a letter that the attorney has also approved. So an email is a little bit informal for that type of communication. You either want to go super informal, kind of a, a deniable, so to speak, conversation where you can say, well, that's not exactly what I meant. Um, that doesn't create the permanent record or a really formal communication like a letter. After a telephone discussion about a court order, forward the order to the client. Again, it's a matter of public record, so there's nothing privileged. That's a really great solution to how to communicate that information to the client. Probably better to have the telephone conversation than just to forward the order out of the blue. That way you can field any questions the client has. But these are some examples of when you ought to send the email and when you ought to try another means of communication. Now we're going to go and talk about the actual email. So the first part is the subject line. You might think to yourself, well, I can't get this wrong. I mean, it's one line. So many emails are lost on this line. So you might have a great email in every other sense, but if you flub the subject line, you have lost a pretty significant portion of the impact that your email could have. Really, there are two things that go in a subject line. The first is the topic of your email. Uh, the second is your client identifier information. You need to have both in every email. They're non-negotiable. You just have to have them. Um, so here's some examples. Smith versus Jones Corp. Need to schedule a meeting. So this is your client identifier. Smith Corp. Widget LLC contract, so this is your, your uh, client identifier, and this is your contract negotiation update. This is your subject. Uh, sometimes you may want to point out that something is especially urgent, time sensitive, important. So you might start with the word urgent or use ASAP in the heading. That's fine, um, but you're still going to need the other material. So you can see here Daniel's probate matter. That's our client matter information. And then you have the information about the particular uh, topic, need information for hearing. So every email needs to have two components with the possibility of an urgent third component. Now I say you can have more than one topic in an email, but I'm just gonna tell you that you wanna avoid that 90% of the time. And if you do happen to have more than one topic, both topics need to be in your subject line. It's hard to get all this in one subject line. So if you have two topics, you have your two topics and you have your client matter information. That's a pretty cram-packed subject matter line. So you're, you're really gonna have to carefully figure out how to word it in that way. Probably better just to use two emails most of the time. So client matter information. In my examples, I have um, the, the, you know, the, the name of the client and a description of the matter. I have the two people who are involved in the contract issue. I have the style of the case, such and such versus such and such. But many times your client matter will look like this. It'll be an alphanumeric version. Let's say Porky Pig is your client. So P, P, I, G might be my alpha, I mean, our, our, my alpha identifier. And he's uh, worked, uh, given us five pieces of business. So we might have some combination of letters and some combination of numbers. I could use this. Let's say um, he's a, a, one of the plaintiffs in the Jones v. Smith Corp. So I could remove the style and slide this 
into uh, the end. Need to schedule a meeting and then add the client identifier. Um, depending upon the circumstances, you may find one means better than the other. Um, obviously, this is only going to have meaning within your law firm. So this wouldn't be as helpful if you're communicating with opposing counsel. They don't know what PPIG 005 is. So you'll want to think through um, how you, you know, whether you want to use the style of the case or the client identifier or both. In a perfect world, you'd probably use both. The benefit of using the client identifier is that it makes it super easy for you to file. Or you may have somebody else in the office who actually files for you perhaps a receptionist, perhaps a file clerk. Well, they don't know the ins and outs of your cases. They're looking for something like this. If you can make their job easier, you may defriend for one thing, and number two, you've increased the likelihood that they will correctly file the information. Even if you're filing it, hey, it's been a busy couple weeks, you haven't gotten to your filing, it's a lot easier to file stuff if all you have to do is put it in this file than to kind of cross-reference and figure out, now who's my client there? Well, what's that particular file number? Um, and so this is a probably a better approach than using the style, but there will be times when you want to use the style. So be sure you're using at least one or the other. Sometimes students send me things in class, for a class, and again, you're going to want to use that same logic. You're going to want to explain what the issue is, and then you're going to also want to include the class. It's important to include the class with an instructor, especially one who's full-time, because the instructor may be teaching seven total classes. And so if you are sending him or her a question about chapter four, well, guess what? He probably or she probably has chapter fours in many of the classes. And so um, the person may know you very well, but may not remember off the bat whether you are in class A or class B or class C. So what happens is you're either inconveniencing your instructor by forcing him or her to look up, well, which class is this person in? And that's probably not creating the vibe you would like to with that instructor. Alternatively, and this is probably more likely, the instructor will email you back going, which class are you in? And now you haven't gotten your answer and you have to provide the information anyway. And so you've delayed the process, you've given yourself more work. So better to just go ahead and include the information. If you don't happen to remember what the information here is, you could always put contracts or, um, you know, the 10 a.m. business law section or whatever the particular class is. But for a class, you'll want to include the class as well as what the issue is. And be as specific as you can when you're doing the um, subject line. So that's the information about the subject line. Uh, spend some time on that when you're writing that. That's probably the single most important part of the communication. The second thing that we want to talk about is the greeting. Um, how are you going to greet this person? So you want to be, you know, fairly warm, but you also want to be professional. And you're going to begin, want to begin with the salad salutation. We always begin with dear. This is the salutation we use with letters and also with emails. It doesn't really mean like we might call our significant other dear. It doesn't have that meaning. So you don't have to worry about sexual harassment or anything. We use this in writing almost all the time. Very occasionally, a legal professional will leave off dear and just say Miss Smith or uh, Mr. Green or whatever. Usually in that case, you're pretty angry at that person. And so you definitely don't want to do that as a general rule. It communicates a very high level of, I'm not even going to extend you the courtesy of saying dear. So now you have a decision to make. You know you're going with dear. You're going to capitalize the D. But now you have to decide, am I going to first name this person or am I going to use an honorific like Ms. or like Mr.? and then their last name. So let's say that we're writing a letter to Mary Smith. We could say, Dear Mary, or we could say, Dear Miss Smith. Um, the choice is going to turn on how well you know the person. If this is a colleague or a client you see on a regular basis, and especially if the, this coworker is, you know, at your level and is approximately your age or younger, it's probably fine to first name them. Um, if you would refer to this person by his or her first name to his or her face, 
it's probably okay to first name them. If this is someone you don't routinely talk to, or if someone who doesn't maybe remember you because it's been a while and you're not someone who's regularly on this person's radar, it's better to be more formal. Err on the side of more formality rather than less formality. Uh, sometimes people will make a mistake and say, Dear Miss Mary Smith. We don't include the first name if we're going to do the honorific, Ms. and Smith. Let's say we want to just say, we want to use Mary for sure. We're not going to include the last name, Dear Mary Smith. So it's this or this. There's not a hybrid that we can use, Dear Mary or Dear Ms. Smith. Another thing some people wonder about is, well, can I say Mrs. Smith? And of course, the way we write Mrs. Smith is MRS. The only time that we use Mrs. Smith is if we're dealing with somebody that we have a pretty clear understanding would prefer Mrs. Typically this is going to be a client whom we aren't interacting in a business type situation. Perhaps we are assisting her with her divorce or prenuptial agreement or um, a, a will or something like that. Something in her personal life. And oftentimes she may be a more mature person, person of a, of a different generation than, than say uh, someone in their 30s or 40s today. So most people we're going to assume prefer Ms. And of course the logic here is we may not know this person's marital status and in most cases their marital status isn't relevant to what we're helping them with. So MS period is our default setting. You're going to use this 99% of the time, probably even more than that. So if you are on the fence, should I use MRS or MS? Use MS. Um, so that is how, oh, the other thing to keep in mind is the colon. In professional correspondence, we use a colon, which is the dot on top of the dot. To make that, we are going to hit the shift button, and then we are going to hit the key to the right of the L button on the keyboard. We don't use the semicolon, which is the winking eye symbol, and we don't use a comma. A comma we use for personal communication. So if this Mary is your sister, we would use Dear Mary, comma. Uh, but if, if, if we are corresponding with our client whom we know very well, we would say Dear Mary, colon. The colon lets the reader know that this is about a business matter. The comma lets the reader know this is about a personal matter. So it's really important that you keep those two straight. Um, sometimes there are other honorifics besides Ms. or Mr. to use. If we are corresponding, let's say that um, this isn't, this, we happen to know that Ms. Green is also Dr. Green. Maybe she's a medical doctor, maybe she's a veterinarian, maybe she has a PhD. In those cases, we absolutely can use Dr. Green and that would be preferred to Ms. Green. We can also use professor if that fits. Um, if we are ever in a position when we, are inter when we are emailing an honorable, then we would replace this with H O N. So an honorable, for example, would be a clerk of a court or a judge. You're probably not going to be emailing those people, so I'm not going to emphasize that as being what you need to do. Again, with, with all these matters, it's good to follow your boss's lead about when to first name people and when not to. If the boss is, is sending letters to or sending emails to Dear Ms. Smith, you probably shouldn't be first naming the person. If the boss is sending it to Dear Mary, that may indicate it is appropriate. On the other hand, the boss may know Mary a lot better than you do, and so it may not be appropriate for you to just because the boss is doing it. Um, so we are now going to stop here and flip on over to our document, which we've been working on. Um, we're going to make progress here. Let me just get started. So now, as you know, we have covered, oops, sorry. Uh, when, to, when to send an email and when not to. Now we're going to discuss the mechanics. And 
We've already talked about this in our uh, PowerPoint. We need to include client matter information and we need to include the topic of the email. If it's urgent, you're also going to want to include that fact in the subject line. If the email is into instructor, obviously we're going to include course information. It's also good to include the section number if you uh, think that the instructor may teach more than one section of the course. Of course, you don't have to look that up. You can just add it, and if it ends up the teacher only teaches one subject, then you don't, you don't have to worry about it. So here's an example of how you would have a subject for an instructor. You have a question about question number four on assignment from chapter seven. So you put that in your subject line, and then you have um, your, co your course information. Again, you could add to it, you know, the section if you wanted to. You could also use the name of the, the course if that's easier for you, if you don't remember the other information. But that takes up more room, so I usually want to save a little bit of typing. If you want the reader to do something, to answer a question, to come to a meeting, to tell you his availability for something, be sure to include that in the subject line. Um, if uh, you include a vague subject line that is, you know, information about the meeting, they may not understand, oh, I need to respond. But if you say, need you to provide dates for meeting, in the subject line, you are significantly increasing your chance of getting a response. It's considerate to the recipient, but really you're thinking about it for your own benefit. Because if you don't include that information, you're probably going to send another email. And you getting the answer is going to be delayed. So make it easy on you by making sure your subject line includes what you want that person to do. So. Here's an example. Instead of saying mediation is your subject line, say needs your availability for mediation. And again, here we have, I have the style of the case as well as the client matter information. If they all will fit, great. Um, but only one of these is absolutely needed. But you can see I'm making it clear before they've even opened it. Oh, this person needs something from me. That's the way to do it. You may want to add a privilege notation. So let's say this is to your client. You might add privileged. Ideally, you would write out the whole word, but it can become really difficult to get all this on here. So you might just put privileged communication if it'll all fit or some abbreviation. You're still gonna have your disclaimer, but the more places you can put it, the better off you're gonna be. The disclaimer is going to be set. It's going to automatically populate in every email that you send. If you put it in the subject line, that's something you're going to the extra effort of doing. So it's a lot more likely that the court is going to take your privilege notation a little bit more seriously than the automatic one that goes out. Your client is also going to take it more seriously because it's in the subject line. So if he or she were, were tempted to forward your email, this may help put the brakes on that. Again, whether you can fit this on the email is going to vary. Sometimes it'll fit, sometimes it won't. Um, it's more important to include the subject and the client matter information than the privilege designation because, of course, you can put the privilege designation in the body of the email as well as the disclaimer anyway. Um, Obviously, you're only going to use this if you're sending it to the client or to somebody else who is functioning on behalf of the client. You're going to want to limit the email to a single topic because it gets really difficult to include more than one topic in the subject line, and it also gets confusing. And many times the reader will kind of start tuning out, okay, you need me to help with question four. Well, I may not notice that you also need help on question 17. I may answer question four, and now you have to email me again and say, hey, wait a second, great answer for, thanks for helping on four, now I need help on 17. It would have been easier perhaps if you had just sent me separate emails. Capitalize all major words in the subject line. So let me just go through examples of subject lines here. So we're gonna capitalize the first word, no matter whether it's a major word or not. Now we're going to capitalize um, uh, 
adjectives and nouns and verbs. Really, the only words we're not going to capitalize are words like a and the and um, prepositions and conjunctions. So prepositions, conjunctions, words like a and an, an things like that. So here we're going to capitalize our first word. We would have capitalized it anyway, though, because it's a noun. Your, um, you don't have to capitalize this one. I think it looks better, though, if you do. Then availability, that's a noun. You're going to capitalize that. Mediation, that's a noun. You're going to capitalize that. You're not going to capitalize the um, uh, preposition for. Now, this only, of course, applies to the subject line. Your email, you're going to just follow the normal rules of capitalization. These are the same rules, by the way, that you would use if you were uh, naming a book or something along those lines. So if you think about your subject line is almost the title of your email, it'll make more sense, perhaps, while you're capitalizing things. If you are responding or replying to an email or forwarding an email, it's very likely you're going to want to change the subject line. So let's go back to this one. So if I were answering this one, I might, or responding to this one with an answer, I might say answer to question four. And let's say I'm providing my availability. I might change my subject line to be my availability for mediation. And I might even list it here. I might say Tuesday. Or something like that. I'm still going to have a text in my email that gives more information. Always evaluate it. Now I probably didn't need to change these because I'm on the same subject, but let's say that I'm the instructor and I want to tell you something on a completely different topic. I want to not only answer question number four, but I also want to tell you um, uh, to remind you to take the final, um, final due tomorrow. Or let's say, in addition to sharing my availability for mediation, I might say, have a question. You know, I need you to get back to me about something. So always evaluate your subject line before you simply reply, because very likely it's going to need to change. Salutation. So this is the dear, Mr., Ms., Doctor, and then the last name with a colon. We've already covered that. But let's go over the rules just real briefly again. And here are some examples. Dear Ms. Green, dear Mr. Rodriguez. Both end in a colon. Both start with dear. We have Ms. for females and Mr. for males. We don't write out those, by the way. And again, if you, unless you know they prefer, do not use it. Do not include the salutation if you're using surnames. So don't say, dear, dear, dear Miss Mary Green. Also don't say, that's wrong, don't say, dear Mary Green. The only time you can say things like Dear Mary Green is if you aren't sure of the person's gender. Let's say you've never met this person and they go by Pat Green. Well, maybe Pat is short for Patrick, maybe it's short for Patricia. And so this would be a time where you could say Dear Pat Green. Obviously, you don't know them well enough to just say Dear Pat. You don't even know their gender, so obviously you don't know them uh, to a significant degree. But um, this is, you know, a, a not so great option, but it's the best of the ones you have available. If there's some way without being stocky <laughs> to figure out the person's gender, better to do that than to use um, Dear Pat Green. So let's say you can find out that Pat is a woman, then you're going to do Dear Ms. Green. So don't use Dear Mr. Bob Chu, just say Dear Mr. Chu. Don't say Dear Susan Horowitz, say Dear, we'll say Ms. Horowitz. And another thing to remember is that attorney in American English, attorney is not a title like Mr. or Ms. or um, Doctor. We don't use it in that way. So 
we don't say dear attorney Broxton. If we don't know, let's say it's Pat Broxton, if we don't know whether attorney Broxton is Patricia or Patrick, we just know Pat, we're gonna say dear Pat Broxton. If we know it's Patrick Broxton, we're gonna say dear Mr. Broxton. If we know it's Patricia Broxton, it'll be dear Ms. Broxton. In fact, don't use a capital attorney and last name. If we are, don't feel comfortable first naming an attorney, just say Mr. whatever or Ms. whatever. Uh, attorney doesn't work as a title to use instead of Mr. or Ms. So again, if you have a, a long-standing and reasonably friendly relationship with the, with the a recipient, you may want to consider first naming that person. This is especially appropriate in the office. Um, when I started practicing law, um, more senior attorneys I referred to as Mr. or Ms. That was the etiquette back then, but that was back in the 90s. And so uh, you may find, especially in smaller law firms, that that's no longer done, or at, le or at least it's not done except maybe with the most senior people. Uh, with clients, because there is some element of, of they're paying for your service, you may be more inclined to use the Mr. or Ms. Um, and certainly if the person happens to be older than you or more senior than you, you'll want to kind of see how people call, refer to this person uh, before you maybe jump in with first names, but it's something to think about. So here we would have an example. Dear Tom or dear Jamil, you see we're still using the a colon here um, to, to uh, format that. So at this time, we're done with the material that you'll need to answer the second round of questions. Um, I look forward to you coming back for our third lecture where we will finish up the topic of emails. Thank you for your attention and have a wonderful day.